Sean, in one minute, minute you can start. Okay, it's, it's quite a story to catch this admit button all the time. Okay, thank you, everybody. Thank you for connecting to this event today. Um, it's another one of our Chris events where we have two people interviewing each other, um, in, having a conversation, and, and we all get to listen and to contribute and ask questions. Um, I'm going to kick off this um, meeting by just introducing Rafi Kaplinski. I'm really happy that, that I can do this. Rafi will then um, introduce Carlota. So let me, let me just quickly say a few words about Rafi. Um, I first came across Rafi's work very early in my development career in the year 2001 with his publication that he did with Mike Morris called A Handbook for Value Chain Research. Rafi, I was searching for my printed copy because I carried it around with me for, for many years. Um, and it's got colorful highlights and pink and yellow post-it notes. It, it was a paper that really made a lot of difference in my world. It was a, a special paper because it also showed that um, academic work can also be practically useful and that we as practitioners can use work that is grounded in deep theory um, to do our development work. I somehow always felt a connection with Rafi's work because I knew in the back of my mind from my friends at IDS that Rafi came from South Africa, although he preceded, um, that was um, a long time ago. And his, Rafi's writings on the global South always seems to have a slightly different empathy and a slightly different angle than, than you find in many papers um, on the South that has a, its origins in a global North postal code. At this moment, Rafi is an honorary professor at, the, at SPRU and an emeritus professional fellow at the IDS. Um, I read somewhere in, in, in one of Rafi's um, websites that he said he grew up in IDS because he was working there from 1969 to 2006, although some of that was part-time. And then at 2006, he moved to the Open University for a few years. And in 2014 or 2015, he moved back um, to the IDS. Uh, Rafi has published extensively. I think he said in his CV, nine books, um, co-authored 17 books, edited many um, special journal issues, published more than 80 journal peer reviewed journal articles and more than 60 book chapters. I, I read that out to my wife this morning and she just shook her head saying, Amazing. So um, Rafi typically writes about technology, about industrialization, globalization, and his recent book on an ad agenda for action um, was seen as one of the best business books of 2021. That was by Martin Wolf of the Financial Times. So Rafi, this is just amazing. It's great that you are here and that you accepted this invitation to um, introduce and um, have this conversation with Carlota. Just something about the program. We'll be spending the next 55 minutes listening to Rafi and Carlota. And then we will have a five minute break. So if you can delay your biological break until then, it would be appreciated. After a short break, um, we will come back and then we will have two guest panel members um, that will ask some questions and that will also share some of their reflections on, on um, Carlota's work. So we've invited, um, I hope I pronounced this right, Gabriela Dutrenet and Slavo Radosovic to, to just contribute to this conversation. And in that part of this afternoon, we will also um, bring in some of the questions from the audience. So we ask that you please, 
If you have questions that you type them in the um, chat box, and then our team will help me to, to formulate those into questions that we will then read out. So Rafi, over to you. Uh, thank you, Sean, for those uh, flattering comments. But of course, this is not about me. This is about Colotta. Uh, so let me begin. Look, I have a tremendous pleasure and privilege to introduce and interview Carlotta Perez. Forbes magazine recently described Carlotta as one of the five economists who redefines everything. But she's, of course, much more significant than that. And to be honest, I don't really know where to begin. And I certainly don't know where to stop. And I don't want to talk too long, since this is our opportunity to hear Carlotta's voice. So how about this as an abridged list to describe Carlotta? Certainly Carlotta's a wonderful friend, generous, sincere and faithful, and has been and remains an insightful and dedicated mentor to colleagues and students throughout the world. Of course, she's a true cosmopolitan. She's lived and worked and immersed herself in Latin America, the US and Europe. How many people know that Carlotta began as an architect and that during her 20s, she was a Marxist and political activist, spending spells in prison and exile. After her initial studies in architecture, Carlotta developed a second specialism as an interdisciplinary social scientist developed during her studies in Paris and then California. And then a third specialism as an economic historian with prodigious knowledge about the UK, the US and Germany, and expertise central to her development of the techno-economic framework, which of course also required her to develop a fourth specialism as a political scientist, forensically unpicking, unpicking the determinants of historically momentous socio-political and technological trajectories. But more than a theorist, Collot has a series of visionary spells as a civil servant, with several highly productive and transformative spells in Venezuelan ministries. She's been an advisor to numerous governments in Latin America, Asia, Africa, and the EU. But her advisory work has not been restricted to interacting with governments. Carlotta has also been a high-level consultant to leading global firms such as VW, IBM, Ericsson, and a supportive and strategic advisor to governments and dozens of SMEs and NGOs in Venezuela and elsewhere. Whew. And these are only fragments, they're only fragments which scratch the surface, describing a truly exceptional friend, thinker, teacher, mentor, and colleague. We live in a world of increasingly and specialized disciplines. The dominance of method over insight overwhelms our profession. We are lost in the massaging of numbers as this provides the key to constructing a fairer and more sustainable world. Our discipline predominantly concentrates on the rigorous analysis of predominantly small questions. These endeavors are obviously important, but too often they divert our attention from understanding the big picture, the major questions and the system dynamics. The metrics of our professional success our obsession with H and I indexes confuse form with substance. So we need to wake up, to widen our horizons, and to recalibrate our measures of what constitutes an academic and an intellectual. And as we'll see, Carlotta provides a role model for all of us. I can't offer this brief and incidentally too long introduction without reflecting on Carlotta's close personal bond and deep intellectual interaction with Chris Freeman. Chris and Carlotta were longtime partners and Chris was crucial in the development of her ideas. But the influence went both ways. In, in my recent rereadings of many of Chris's publications, I was struck by the number of occasions in which Chris paid tribute to the impact which Carlotta had on his own worldview and his understanding of the significance of the interaction of technology and the socio-political. I think this will become clear as we hear Carlotta's voice. So Carlotta, let's begin. Fasten your seatbelt. Question number one. Life experiences shape our understanding of the world. Our understanding of the world shape our life experiences. So how did you get 
where you are now. Well, <laughs> thanks for the introduction, Rafi. You are a very generous friend. Um, how did I get here? Well, I didn't plan it, that's for sure. I never planned to become an academic. I always had a passion for big picture explanations, but I began uh, by wanting to be an architect, which is like, you have to think of form and function and people and who's gonna use it and how. So, so it was really, but I think we have to blame Friedrich Engels and Chris Freeman for my being here. Why Engels? Well, uh, when I was about 21, I was absolutely fascinated by the big picture of the origin of the family, private property, and the state. To see history as an evolving system from technology to politics was so fantastic, it literally blew my mind. So that was, that's one person to blame. The other person to blame is of course, Chris. I was actually a director of technological development in the Ministry of Industry in Venezuela, my little country, that was my life and so on. And I needed to convince ministers of the huge transformation that was going on and that we needed to worry about technology. So I couldn't think of anything better than invite this very famous person and, the, and with three others from Spru to try to convince the ministers. But actually he didn't convince the ministers. They were not convincible, but he convinced me to come to Spru. So that's how it all began. But I did have a bit of luck. The reason why I'm working in all these is not just these two fantastic minds that helped me get here. Uh, I was actually, because of my parents having divorced, I did my high school in New York City. You know when? In the 1950s. And you know what was happening then in the US? It was the American way of life. It was the mass production revolution right in front of my eyes and with me participating in it, but being an architect and therefore an elitist separate observer of this phenomenon, this herd phenomenon that was going on. So I was actually very much an observer. That was important. Then another bit of luck, I happened to have been exiled in Prague. You know when? In the 1960s, in the late 60s, when they were preparing their democratic, uh, not a revolution. Yeah, it was a revolution. They wanted to change peacefully, but they weren't allowed to, the tanks sort of stopped that. That was a big shock for me. What was this, this socialism, apart from seeing that it wasn't really fulfilling and that it was using the same technologies as capitalism. So that sort of got me thinking. Then once I had sort of understood that probably Marx was wrong, I studied in Paris at a time of very intense intellectual uh, atmosphere, because this was just before the 68 uprising. So it was really universities, everybody thinking big things. And that's when I was studying there with fantastic teachers, by the way. Then I was in Venezuela in the middle of the oil crisis in the 1970s. I was in government and I was being asked, what are the consequences of high priced oil? So it was really another big question to answer that had to do with all these changes in society. Then <clears throat> when I did my master's in California, it was in Silicon Valley. So, I was in the middle of where the change was beginning to happen so I could see it directly. And finally, of course, being able to invite Chris from a government post that was capable of doing this. Of course, I had another incredible opportunity. And then of course, uh, Spru and all the rest. But I mean, I have been very, very lucky. Now, my ideas then, are, as Rafi says, very closely connected with my life. 
Uh, of course, I got the big picture since architecture and then angles about technology shapes society. Then the question in Paris about Marx and Engels, were they wrong about the forces of production defining, determining the mode of production, the organization of society? Well, you know what I did in France? I actually studied Athens and Sparta to see if they had different uh, forces of production. They didn't, they had the exact same ones, except one worked with slaves that were born slaves and the other one was a democracy with a few slaves in, in the mines. So actually it was like the Soviet Union and the US two completely different systems with the same forces of production. But still, I thought mm, there might still be something in that. It's not that socialism is the next thing, but there was something in that. So um, I then, with the question in Venezuela about oil, I discovered that technologies were all interconnected. Every single thing of the American way of life was based on cheap oil, cheap plastics, cheap petrochemicals for agriculture, cheap, it was all connected to oil. So what was going to happen when oil became expensive? <laughs> then I discovered cheap microelectronics and it just dawned on me. You know what's going to happen? Cheap microelectronics is going to replace cheap oil as the determinant of the direction of technology. And even though I didn't think of paradigms at the time, because I hadn't yet read Kuhn, which I did in California afterwards, I called it a technological style, which was had something to do with Varsavsky, an Argentinian who had talked about technological styles. So then uh, I get to I decided to do a, a master's to, to find out about all this. I was so excited about this technical change thing and what did it mean? So I then went to do this master's. And of course, I discovered Conrad, Thief, Schumpeter, and Chris Freeman. I actually read Chris Freeman's 74 book in California, the one about uh, the economics of industrial innovation. But of course, I, did, I didn't know him. So he, it, he was just an author, you know, like you have just an author, a recent author, not, not like Schumpeter, who was already there. So uh, I then realized the notion of technological revolutions and figured because of the Marxian idea that I still had in my head, that society had to respond, that it couldn't just happen by the market, that it had to be somehow with some response. So perhaps there could be new opportunities for development. So excited again about this, I went to Venezuela, figuring that we had to respond to what was going to be a tsunami of technical change, and a tsunami of political changes, probably uh, through the IMF that was pushing everybody. Venezuela was still protected by, by the high oil prices, so we didn't have to open to open our borders immediately. So when I got back from California, I designed the directorship of technological development for the Ministry of Industry. And then very much against my will, because I didn't like being a boss, I accepted. I accepted the role because I thought it was really important. And that's how I got to need to invite Chris, because nobody believed me. It was amazing. It was happening. It was so obvious to me and nobody could see it. So of course, when Chris came, uh, <laughs> as I said, he didn't really make a huge change in the ministry, <clears throat> but he certainly made a radical life change for me. He made me become an academic. He opened a vast field of knowledge for me. He complimented everything. He provided me all his powerful thinking. His intellectual support and generosity were boundless. Without Chris, I wouldn't be here and I will never thank him enough. And that's how I got here, Rafi. 
Well, thank you, Carlotta. And I think you rather underplayed your impact on Chris's work. As I said, when I read his work, I'm struck by the number of times that he, he refers to your work. Uh, we're talking, or you described yourself as an academic. You're much more than an academic, Carlotta. And the problem with these sessions, or one of the problems with these sessions we're having is that we focus on, on, on individuals as intellects and as thinkers. And of course, that's important. We're going to do that today. But you have a very interesting personal life as well. You're the daughter of a very well-known Venezuelan artist who lived over a hundred with a twin sister. Your father was a very distinguished engineer. You had two siblings who were distinguished inventors and engineers. So uh, we should keep in mind, not just the, the, the journey you've been on intellectually, but the journey you've been on as a person as well. So uh, before I move to the next question, Colotta, one of the things Chris credits the two of you with is the distinction between different types of innovation. Uh, he distinguishes between incremental radical systems innovation and transformative innovations. The transformative innovations are offer en enormous advantages for cost and for products. Uh, they're in unlimited supply, they have descending cost and critically, they run across the whole spectrum of all economic and social activities. And it's that which distinguishes these transformative technologies. So you've pointed to the centrality of oil to the previous wave. Do you want to say something about the centrality of ICTs to the wave we're in and where we're going in the future? Well, the first thing I should say is that lots of people think that it's over. There is this whole uh, fourth revolution thing from the Davos people, from Klaus Schwab, as if artificial intelligence and, um, and robotics were a different revolution. Unfortunately, due to finance, we are still global finance, which still controls everything. Uh, we are not yet where we should be with the information revolution. And what has happened is that after a while, after a lot of transformations, because information revolution is the revolution we have in our hands, it's the best tools we have to transform the world, it's the best tools we have to do the green transition, and also to solve the inequality question and the lifting the whole of the developing world also. So it is the most powerful tool, it is also it dematerializes things. I mean, digital technologies are, are, have been already capable of dematerializing film, music, books, newspapers, the, all sorts of things. We are actually gradually doing that, but we're not doing enough. There is much more that a paradigm like this could do, especially when we think about the green transformation. And even having, having this enormous potential what has happened is because finance has decoupled itself completely, which it always does in the early period, in the uh, installation period, I call it the first few decades of creative destruction, when the old technologies are being replaced, at first they began, but finance then has become just the system for financing finance. They are global, they play around, they bet on all sorts of things, of course, uh, Real estate is one of the most important, but you know, stocks and bonds and this and that, they don't invest in stocks, meaning investing in a company in order to make that company grow and be more. No, they're investing only as a, as a game, like a casino. So even though information technology is capable of transforming absolutely every industry, absolutely every activity, every service, even agriculture, uh, we have less investment in those things as there should be, less investment in green technologies than there should be, and especially something really strange, which is that somehow venture capital has been pushed to the outside into escaping games, crypto, whatever, and not really collaborating enough with the other industries to transform the whole economy, because that's what a paradigm does. The paradigm transforms the whole economy. And that's what digital technologies could do if we could set up the directionality that the state has to provide, which it isn't because of this free market 
ideology that has been so powerful. Carlotta, I want to come back to the issue of finance uh, later on, but just to pick up two points you made. Firstly, and it was resonant in what you said earlier uh, uh, about the, your observations in Prague, is the fact that directionality is critical. And whatever unfolds is not inevitable. There are different routes to the exploitation of a particular paradigm. Uh, and that's a, what transpires becomes a matter of social action. But we'll come to that later on. I also want to, before asking the next question, just to pass on to a, perhaps what might be a personal uh, concern for me. Your description of electronics really exemplified how it's central to everything that happens around us. Often, biotechnology is conflated with electronics and bundled together, for example, in Industry 4 as a similarly transformative technology. And I think, for me, that's an error. That's an error. And I think the, the, the real contribution, as I've tried to point out earlier on, one of the real contributions of your work with Chris is to distinguish these different families of technologies. And the bio-revolution is really a systems technology rather than a transformative technology. And I think there's so much air and clutter around the fourth industrial revolution and conflating these things together. I think the analytical part of the story gets lost. But anyway, uh, let me go on to my next question. Uh, in my view, your, your 1988 paper with Chris uh, was truly seminal in the Dosi book. Uh, it added the social and the political to Schumpeter and Chris's pioneering work on technological revolutions. So which, if any, comes first? Does the technological revolution come early and shape the social, or does the social and organizational framework shape the evolution of the technology? This addition, in a way, the, the exemplification of the early Freeman model was a really important contribution. Would you like to just ruminate a bit on that? Well, yeah, that article, the main idea was mismatch. Uh, I mean, the main idea about this relationship. So obviously, since we're talking about uh, government policy, giving direction to change, social change, making, giving precisely sort of shaping technologies, it looks like tech major ch technical change would come first. But I think actually, First of all, there is a constant interaction. Even the Thatcher-Reagan destruction of the Keynesian democracy apparatus was, in terms of how the market economy works, was a way of clearing, clearing the field so that uh, the new technologies could. They didn't understand what they were doing, but that's what has been done historically all the time because there is so much pressure from finance to take away all the fetters. Uh, current populism is a change in, in politics, the decline of social democratic parties, which is the result of technical change and the way it happens. And you know, it, it is not shaping the technologies either, but they are stopping change from happening because there is so much anger, rightful because of all the created destruction. But uh, of course, what is clear is that golden ages depend on major institutional changes. You've got to set up a win-win game between business and society in order to have a golden age. So uh, yes, in a way, we should understand that technological revolutions come first, the, uh, social institutional revolutions respond and shape that, but then when technologies mature, then new conditions have to be set up for them to have the big experiment that defines what the technologies can do. So it's not a black and white picture, but certainly now we are at the door of a possible golden age and we're doing nothing about it. And the, and the community of innovation studies is not studying institutional innovation. We don't know how it happens. We don't know, you know, we studied the, industry, the science industry link, the technology industry, university industry link. How about the uh, university policy link? We've got to do that. And that because precisely because we now need to make 
major changes. Think of all the changes that were done after the war to set up the, the world boom, the economic boom. So many institutions, so many things, including the whole of the welfare state. So we have a big job ahead and we better do it well. Uh, you said we're not doing anything about shaping the new direction. I think I know at least one person who is, and she's sitting in front you of are. me, Carlotta. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Carlotta, I once asked Chris if he was a technological determinist. And he said, yes, I am a technological determinist. And I must say, I have a great realm of confusion. Uh, clearly, the way social relations clearly have an impact on the shaping of technology. Technology is not neutral, it takes different directions. And yet at the same time, clearly there are unfolding technological developments which shape society. And you know, we're sharing, I hope, a common sense of uncertainty of how analytically we get that balance right and how politically we get that balance right between the extent to which our world is being shaped by this unfolding drama momentum of innovation in, in ICTs and our warped attempts to try and give it directionality. And I'm not sure that the phrase technological determinism quite captures the story, but somewhere in the TEP framework, there's, uh, the, uh, there's an embedded idea of some form of technological determinism. As you say, the same, TP gave us Stalin uh, and social democracy. So there are enormous variations, but nevertheless, the mass production, the unfolding of mass production was something which changed the world around us as well as being changed by the world around us. So if, if you're happy or you want to come back on that, uh, I'd like to move on to another question, unless you want to come back on this interaction between the social and the technological. I just want to defend Chris. When he said, I am a technological determinist, he was really fighting against the people who, who want to say that markets do everything and you know, and you don't. So he was actually fighting another enemy. Now I think it's pretty clear the that he would he would actually fight fight the technological determinist instead. It depends who the enemy is, is at each time. And he was a very good fighter. He was a very good fighter. I'm not as good as he is, certainly. I'm actually right. quite, yeah. I haven't noticed your reticence, but anyway, <laughs> we're, we're agreeing that there's a great complexity mm -hmm. to this interaction between technology and social relations. So let me move on. Uh, as I said, I think your 1988 book was really, uh, the article with Chris was really, really um, transformed our view of the way in which we thought about economic history uh, and waves or surges, depending on what you call them. Your 2002 book was similarly path-breaking, uh, although singly authored rather than authored to, uh, solely with Chris. Uh, it was path-breaking, not just because it spelled out the Perez Freeman techno-economic framework, but because for the first time, it brought finance into the equation. As you pointed out earlier on, we live in a financial casino economy, but how does the story of finance fit into your techno-economic paradigm, both as a fetter and a blocker to transition, and also as the handmaiden to the golden age, which you so redundantly, redundantly mapped out as a possibility? Well, yeah, it's complicated because uh, the whole model is that the first two decades are led by finance. It's the only way because it's a big experiment. There is a lot of risk. Nobody, absolutely nobody knows where those new technologies can go. They have a sense of some central things, but the actual where the technologies are going is not clear. And it's a big experiment. That's why you have bubbles. You have lots of companies going bust, lots of some giants at the end, because there is a bubble at the end. And you do need this uh, role of finance. In fact, what makes capitalism powerful is that it separates finance from production. Different people are working in the finance world and in the production world. They're both 
indispensable to each other, because of course the production ones are creating the wealth and finance is moving the money. So you, we need both. But the thing is that for the first few decades when we have created destruction, finance does a better job. But once we know where the technologies can go and where the technologies have already gone and when we already have the giants and all the rest, then we have to come in with society and then it's production capital that should take the reins of the economy. It's the state that should create the context and be active, proactive in transforming the economy using what we already know, because the potential of the technologies is clear and therefore it can now be done. And not only is the potential of the technologies clear, but there is also clarity about the destruction that it created. It destroyed regions, it destroyed industries, it destroyed skills, it destroyed jobs. So we now have to regain a win-win game between business and society. We've got to then, and that's what golden ages are about. It's when finally capitalism manages to bring some more people, lift some more people up thanks to this new productivity. So basically the, the two play different roles and, uh, and finance, of course, is crucial then. But it's also crucial for it to get out of the way and become a server, an actual instrument for production capital and for general well-being of the society. And that's what the golden ages are about. And that's why we have to reconnect finance with production. We have to recouple them. And we also have to somehow at this point, because finance has become global and is completely separate from everything, find a way of regulating finance, find a way of getting them to pay taxes, find a way of getting them to invest in the real economy and not just playing in a casino. So it is finance is crucial, but taking control of finance has become now the most crucial task for any possibility of a golden age. So uh, let's just uh, uh, waste a few minutes in the academic analytical world. Uh, Pulansis, the Greek Marxist, distinguished between different fractions of capital. And I think your story of finance tells us that there are different fractions of finance capital. There's the speculative uh, 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 fraction, if you like, which seems to be dominant. And then there's the part of finance which can drive the productive economy. And I think if you were looking at history not being foretold, the grasping of power by the neoliberals in the early 1980s uh, and the use of quantitative easing as a form of reflation of the balancing of supply and demand, the idea that you could throw money into the system to the banks and the banks would lend it to productive capital, of course, was a terrible, terrible error in historical terms. And that form of reflating the economy has given us and consolidated this massive, massive speculative financial capital. So before we move on, you mentioned the word bubbles. In your 2002 book, you talk about the bubble in each of the wave. I think you distinguish the 1998-99 tech bubble from the 2008 financial crash. I don't want to get lost there. But has the bubble burst or are we waiting well, for the bubble this is to not burst? The first time, this is not the first time we have more than one bubble. The first revolution had two bubbles. The third revolution had about 12 bubbles because they happened in all sorts of different countries, even though the British were funding from England. We had bubbles in Australia, New Zealand, Argentina, the US, everywhere. So uh, we don't have to have only one bubble. There can be two, there can be five. I think we're waiting for another bubble very soon. I've been thinking it was going to come before. I don't know if COVID changed circumstances, but certainly the last thing that governments have to do after any bubble, I think the 2008 was ideal for doing the right thing, is to control finance, to regulate it, to put in jail a few of the crooks and, and actually get the economy going with, even if you give money to finance, it's got to be condition, with conditionalities. It should have said, here's the money, but you've got to invest in this and this and that, and you've got to do this and the other. 
you can't just give the money and do whatever you want, which is what they've done, which is destroy practically a lot of the economy instead of reconstructing it. So um, I would say, yes, definitely. One of the problems is that the post bubble control of finance, which is what actually allows the golden ages to happen, has not happened. And I think that is the most serious problem of our time. It is the one that has made this the longest installation period, you know, the longest time waiting for a golden age with these technologies. It's the one that, that has made capital go in all the different directions instead of um, uh, setting the whole economy going. I think it's going to be at fault if the US declines definitely as world power. I think it could kill the UK. Uh, it, is, it is a very serious situation and, uh, and it's all the fault of the way finance has been treated. And I don't see how governments and supranational institutions will come to regulate finance because finance is now unregulatable. It's, it's way out in its own separate global world. So yes, that, that is my, the main source of my pessimism. Uh, I don't want to get lost in the story of China, but of course we have a financial bubble, a real estate bubble in China as well. But I look, I've just tightened my seatbelt because as most people know, uh, we have uh, lost or got rid of a uh, prime minister in Britain and the three leading candidates are all bankers who've made their money in financial speculation. So uh, uh, anybody wants to offer me a Portuguese passport, you're absolutely welcome. Um, Carlotta, you're, as I've already pointed out, the, for me at any rate, your seminal contribution, I mean, you've made many, many contributions, including one which we won't have time to talk about at the, uh, the, today, which is the, the importance of lifestyles which I know you've been thinking about, but perhaps you might have time to talk about that later on. But the 1988 paper with Chris, as I've said, for me was critical. The 2002 book pointing specifically to the role of finance we've just been discussing. I have read the drafts of your new book, which isn't complete yet, but your new book is around directionality. Uh, it's a frightening historical juncture, and you're asking the question, of what are the determinants of which way this uh, evolution of the new paradigm uh, will go. So do you want to just tell us a bit about the book, what you're aiming to do, where it's going, what you think perhaps the contributions are, where the areas which worry you most? I know you haven't finished it yet, which is I always- I certainly a, haven't. <laughs> it's, it's a difficult period. It's a difficult period, but nevertheless, these are the fertile moments. And often in talking about things, one gets insights one hadn't thought about something else. So maybe in your answer to this comes the key, the solution to your it. problems. <laughs> now, the main thing I have to say is that it's an enormous task and it was very foolhardy of me to undertake it. Uh, imagine, I'm not, a, I'm not an economic historian. I'm not a historian at all. And I yes, you are. Go, yes, you are. Yes, you are. I have become one because I've been working now for years in this book, but it is very, very tough. What I'm doing, I'm taking each technological revolution, identifying all the features of its paradigm, looking at how the installation period went, then what happened at the turning point, which is what happens after the bubble and when all the problems are visible. Then what happens in the golden age, and especially throughout the whole thing, what was the role of the state? What's the role of government and also of social forces, unions, any, any other structured social forces? What, what is happening each time? How each paradigm matures and gives way to the next one. So the next revolution, I start again and I do the whole thing. But you would think that's bad enough. No, I did the first one and the second one, only Great Britain, because that's where really all the action in the core countries happened. But for the third, I did US, Germany, and UK. And for the fourth, I've done Hitler, Stalin, 
and the US. And the US, of course, much more because, because there is so much, it's much more recent and it's much more, um, you know, it has more weight on what's happening now very long, including studying import substitution, industrialization, and so on. Then for the fifth, I'm doing, I'm trying to then, the fifth is the one that began with the microprocessor in 1971, and we're still there, and the one that should now provide the golden age, which, by the way, a very important aspect of what I think uh, in terms of this revolution is that it's, it would be capable of lifting the whole, practically the whole of the global south. It, it's possible. It's possible for two reasons, because the technologies are capable of doing it, and because the north, the advanced west, desperately needs markets which are not just consumer markets, but equipment markets, engineering markets, education markets, luxury markets, the whole things where they, they have some advantage and that would create jobs. I also think there are other things to change, like uh, doing having a rental economy rather than possession in order to reduce the materials and be able to cover more people with the same appliances, et cetera, et cetera. But anyway, basically, it's an enormous thing to do. But talking about the actual historical conditions, I am now trying, believe it or not, to explain why the four tigers were able to, to leap to development, why import substitution in Latin America was not able to leap to development, why China was able to do what it has done, why the US is in danger, why all these things, using all that I learned in the other things. And then I'm also trying to enrich the theory that I provided before about finance, capital, and revolutions to uh, the role of the state and technological revolution. So as you can imagine, it's a big, big job. And that was crazy. It's like climbing the Everest without Sherpas. I've actually thought that maybe it'll end up being posthumous. Maybe not. Maybe I'll live as long as my mother. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, that, that's Carlotta, it. <laughs> uh, uh, as I said, I've read quite a lot of the drafts. It's, a, it's an enormous task you've taken on. I'm sure you'll finish it. I have no doubt at all you'll finish it. It will be imperfect. Everything's <laughs> imperfect and work in progress. But uh, I think we all await that with great eagerness. Uh, and I want to just mix metaphors, if you don't mind. I want to talk about the agony of birth, of the transition to a more sustainable direction uh, uh, in this wave we're experiencing at the moment. So that's metaphor one, number one. Metaphor number two is the distinction between fetters and blockers. Blockers are the things where somebody is actively trying to stop us from doing something because they have a vested interest in what was there beforehand. The fetters are, or the blinkers are, the, the things which stop us seeing the future. So how much of the inability to move decisively to a more sustainable trajectory in the new wave is a function of opposing forces and how much of it is just that individually and collectively we don't have the imagination to build the world which which we, which you know we are capable of building is that a fair question uh, of course <laughs> Yeah, no, obviously, obviously the, the opposition from not only the, the oil companies and all the ones that have, I mean, we are talking about a whole world of success that was built on mass production. Then, as you, Rafi, have said, and I think it was a brilliant explanation of what was happening, we have China picking up the same model the same waste, the same oil-based, coal-based, gas-based, all fossil fuel-based economy, fossil fuel-based consumption. I mean, the whole pattern we're talking about from practically from, I guess, 1913 until now, more than 100 years, where we have, had, we have been building this model and everybody who has become rich, almost without exception, is tied to that past. We haven't yet 
there are, of course, the exceptions are the, the, uh, the giants of, of ICT, but even they, of course, are using a lot of energy and they're not, they're trying, but they're, they're still using the same old stuff. So basically we are against the very enormous inertia of the old model together with the active enemies. Don't forget how it happened when, when we were trying to stop people from smoking, how the companies were capable of creating all sorts of ways of stopping the campaign from succeeding. So I would say that much more than 50% of the problem is, is opposition. Now, not seeing the solutions, I think is also important, but I think there are two sorts of problems of not seeing the solution. One is that a lot of young people are very worried about, they're very aware of the problem, but they seem to have sort of caught the wrong end of the problem. Uh, it, it's the degrowth idea because so all these people who are opposing the change are actually um, very rich and very much the ones that are in this world of inequality, they are the ones who have gotten the winner takes all uh, wealth. So uh, there is this idea of eliminating first class on airplanes, all the Mac mansions, all the, you know, it's the anger against the rich. And that uh, leads us to think that what we need is to stop growth. In fact, what I can say to that is that Chris said very simply, it's not the rhythm of growth that we need to change. We need to change the nature of growth and the distribution of its results, the distribution of the wealth it produces. So, we need masses of technology and investment to do the green transition. We need to dematerialize production and consumption. That's all technology and investment. We need to lift millions in the global south waiting for the good life. Again, that's all technology and investment. And investment and social institutional innovation within countries, between countries, so to get a fairer society, uh, we're not going to do it by stopping growth or will stopping growth guarantee that we save the planet. So I wish we could go all get together and, and think of this new, the new ways in which one by one, all the changes we have to make in our lifestyles, in in the way we build our buildings, the way we live, the way we use, the way we move around, the way we use our cities, transforming everything, the food we eat, how we eat it, all those changes which are so complex and which require not only our change, but also the interest of investors in, in, and of innovators. And for that, you know what we have to do? The state has got to change radically the relative profitability of investing in the bad things or in the good things. So that's big. That's another, that's institutional change, major institutional change. So obviously <laughs> fetters in the sense that we don't have a strategy. We don't have a clear path and we don't know what to ask governments to do in order to get this done. We just want Zero, zero, uh, net zero. Let's get to net zero. What do you mean net, get to net zero? Give me one, two, three, four, five, six, seven things that we have to do. That's what Mariana Matsukato is trying to do. That's what the IAPB is trying to do. That's what the Energy Group in Spru is trying to do. But we're not doing enough and we're not putting it together. And without that, the opposition is much more powerful because they're fighting against, against something that's in. <laughs> that's not clear. That's not held by everybody. In fact, what I think is that we should have a plan which should be acceptable to both finance, the right, whatever you want to call it, and, and society, the, the majorities, and, and the left. 
we should be able to find something. And I think uh, the Club of Rome have been have been participating in the in the book they're preparing, they're bringing out now that tries to do just that to draw a feasible path with all the things that have to be done along the way. And yes, I would say that uh, if we don't have that, it's very difficult to win against the opponents that are very powerful. Mm. Okay. Um, we shouldn't be too negative and too pessimistic. After all, we did stop smoking. <laughs> so your metaphor. So there are things we can do, and we have to be hopeful about the future. The one thing I learned chairing very difficult meetings is if there's a really contentious issue, leave it to the very last item because everybody has had their word already and you can slip through anything you want to do if you leave it close enough to the end of the meeting. So the really contentious issue, the elephant in the room is the one that, one of their ones, is the one you've just addressed now, which is this really the question of different growth, degrowth, or no growth. But you've already addressed some of this. And of course, I'm sure some of the questions will pick it up. So I've got one last question for you, Carlotta, uh, since time is running out. What lessons can we learn from your experience for younger researchers? <laughs> well, the problem is that I'm an oddball. I'm mainly self-taught. Um, but that's a lesson. You know. That's a lesson. You mean, because, you mean well, that anybody can be an oddball and still... No, but I that people are, people are pushed into silos, particularly, I'm afraid, in economics and to some extent in innovation <laughs> studies, where the dominance of numbers and computers and large databases just stops you seeing what's happening in the real world. Sorry, I'm answering your question. No, it's what okay. lessons, well, the, what the lessons are there for younger people? Being, being an oddball, <laughs> that's, that's a strange thing. Not only that, you know when this whole story with Chris began? When I was already in my mid-40s. So again, one lesson, not for young people, but for everybody, is that there, it's never too late <laughs> to do whatever it is that you want to do in life. But basically, if I'm talking to the young people, and I love to talk to the young people, I didn't have children, so I adopt every one of my students. Uh, don't get stuck in academic ivory towers. Connect with the world. Go out. Go try to connect with policymakers. Try to connect with NGOs. Try to connect with people who are acting, people who are changing. Find out what's really happening. Uh, don't get stuck in disciplinary silos. Everything is interconnected. I do agree that we're all different. There are some of us that like generating hypotheses, others like experimenting, others like testing hypotheses and actually banging hypotheses down. That's great. We need everybody. We need all sorts of things. But everybody, whatever your tendency, primary research is critical for all. We've got to connect. We've got to, to, to question people, to talk to the actors, to know what's happening. Because you know what? Aggregate figures are very likely to hide what's really happening. To begin with, there are many cases in which you have something going down and something going up, and then they give you the aggregate, which means nothing because you're not noticing what it is that's going down and what's going up. And this is typical of paradigm shifts. For, for about 10 or 20 years, all data is wrong because it doesn't say what's really happening. But this happens in almost every case. So do field work. Don't be fooled by the data. You have to know what's underneath it. But most of all, be passionate about your work. I know there are people who are naturally not passionate. Well, just love what you're doing. Do something that matters to you. Don't just do whatever is going to get you to a job because you know what? If you do something that's going to get you a job, you might be miserable in that job. Fight for what you really want, even if it takes you longer because life is too important to live unhappily. Thank you, you Colotta. I want live it happily you're not likely to make a difference. And that's going to matter to you. I want to go back to my opening words, Carlotta, because it's two o'clock. Let me read what I said. What a pleasure and privilege I have to introduce and interview Carlotta Perez. 
Forbes magazine recently described you as one of the five economists who redefines everything. But of course, you're much more significant than that. I didn't know where to begin, and we could have gone on for a long time. We're very privileged to be able to live and work with you, Carlotta. You're not just an intellect. We didn't have time to talk about your political activism, your time in prison. We didn't have time to talk about what a great friend you are of mentor to other people. And we certainly didn't have enough time to unpick your ideas and your contributions in enough detail. But we had a taster. And thank you very much. We're very privileged to have been able to hear you. Over to you, Sean. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rafi, for um, leading these questions on all our behalf. And thank you that these questions were so well prepared and, and, and thought through. So um, we're going to take a five minute break now. We call it the biological break. Please be back in five minutes in whichever time zone you are now. That will be five minutes past the hour. And then we will go on with the second half of the program. Thank you very much.
Rafi, those were very well thought through questions there. You are muted. Thanks, Sean. That was you speaking, was it? Yes, it was me. Yeah, no, Carlotta and myself prepared it. You'd never go unprepared into meeting with Carlotta. She's <laughs> formidable. She's formidable. Okay, the people will start coming back now. Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, well, thanks for having me anyway. And what, you're going to give 10 minutes each to, the, to Slavo and Gabi? Yes, yes. Okay, great. So just a reminder to everybody that's listening, if you have any questions, please type them into the chat and then we will try to pose as many of those to Carlota as we can. Okay, I'm giving everybody the full benefit of this minute and then we will start. Okay, so um, before we started, we were talking about timeliness. We are going to assume that everybody is back and listening, but to make double sure, Rajesh, can we just make sure that um, Carlota's video is back on? And then I'm going to invite um, Gabriela and Slavo as two panelists to just comment on, on what they've heard and to maybe from their perspective also um, comment about um, the work of Carlota over time. I don't know who's going to go first, Slavo. I see you on my screen at the moment. Ah, there we go. Gabriela's also on screen. Gabriela goes first, yeah. Gabriela goes first. Oh, so Gabriela, you go first. Yes, <laughs> thank you. Okay. Well, thanks a lot for the, for the invitation. It is a honor to me to share this space with Carlota, Ralph, and Slavo. They are both, part, all of them are part of my bibliography. And then specifically about Carlota, what can I, I, I add, no? her sensibility on what is going on into the real life, what was clear in her presentation some minutes ago, and her capacity and energy to see opportunities anywhere. I love this part of Carlota, looking for opportunities, always the windows of opportunities everywhere, which is excellent because then we can, we can have... A, uh, stimulus to, to try to find out these opportunities. So let me put uh, two questions to, she has to add two questions because the interaction between Carlota and, Ra and Rafi was so interesting, no? but always we can add some, some question to, to focus on some specific. I'm not here. Yeah, sorry. Ca Carlota, can you, can you hear us? Okay. R Rajesh will edit, edit that part out of the video, don't worry. Okay, Gabriela, back to you. Okay, I'm going straight to, you, you, you missed the presentation, the introduction, but I'm going right to the, to the question. So, so particularly in Latin America, we have this issue of the import substitu substitution industrialization, which was a so important period between the, the 50s and the, and the 70s. And then you have in Latin America, the, the people are divided. No, You have the defenders and you have the detractors of the import substitution industrialization model, no? And then why do you defend the protected import substitution so strongly if you say it could not lead to catching up processes? So can you say something, can you add some more words about it? Okay, well, the first thing I need to say for those of you who are not Latin American, because every Latin American knows what import substitution, our industry import substitution was, is that we did, we uh, got either with foreign investment or with local investment, we used the mature technologies of the North, and with that created an assembly <laughs> industry importing all the parts from wherever. At the end, we were importing them for tai from Taiwan and from Asia in general. But basically, it was assembling manufactured goods. 
uh, fabricated goods and for the domestic market with very high protection. The protection was actually enough to make sure that you practically couldn't import the product from anywhere because it was made so that you could have low productivity, high prices, but everybody could buy it with the salaries that there were in the country. So everything was more or less, it was reasonably organized and that brought uh, a lot of Latin American countries quite far in terms of increasing the middle class, uh, creating quite a large working population, even if they were doing something very simple, just a, a screwdriver assembly, as it's normally called. Uh, we also had processing industries, which were a little different because you couldn't import the tomatoes. You had to use the tomato, the local tomatoes. So you had to do some innovation. So in most countries, the processing industries actually learned things that the fabricating industries didn't learn. So we had that. But basically what happened was that this, this whole sort of non-technological, non-learning copycat sort of uh, fabrication and industrialization was surrounded by an enormous amount of investment in infrastructure. So every Latin American country, in contrast with some in Africa and some in Asia, actually with that false process of industrialization, set up the ports, the infrastructure, the electricity, the roads, the everything, and the education system, which had to educate people to work in these companies because you needed managers and so on. It set up the banking system. The, so everything that you need around industrialization developed thanks to that model. However, mm -hmm. we didn't learn very much technology in terms of the fabricate, fabricating industries. We did learn the, from the processing industries and we also learned more about our own natural resources. So there were good things that came and they create this middle class, educated middle class that could be capable of taking advantage of another opportunity. Now, why do I agree that it couldn't get you to catching up? Because catching up is about capacity for innovation. You've got to be able to learn what you're doing and to build on that and to innovate, which is what the Four Tigers did. So basically, what I think is that that was the best opportunity at the moment, because we began very early. Some countries began in the 50s, others in the 60s. And the actual maturity of the, uh, of the mass production revolution was in the 70s, was at the end of the 60s and in the 70s. By that time, we already had a whole 20 years of import substitution protected. So industry, the, the business people were used to that. And when the Koreans and the others were, were fighting because they didn't have, they didn't have um, raw materials to get the money with which to do, uh, you know, to finance and subsidize uh, industry. When they actually became competitive, Latin America did not have the capacity to, to advance on such flimsy basis. However, we do have a level of development on many countries like Brazil and uh, several, Chile, Mexico have, have capacities to take advantage of this new opportunity, which I hold is uh, natural resources, technology, and, uh, and inclusion. Uh, because the Asians, in my view, already took all the fabricating industries. They are already super competitive in that, and we cannot compete. It's impossible. And also the, the, the cost of our labor, even though it's very low in our terms, it's not as low as it could be in Bangladesh or something. So I would say that we have a new opportunity, but we have that opportunity, and we also have the capabilities in the processing industries to be able to do natural resources and their processing and the and all the new technologies that could be associated, including greening the natural resources. 
So basically what I say is that uh, um, developing countries have op windows of opportunity and those windows of opportunity move. And you know, up to, up to a point, a window works. If you continue there, you, you go down. That's what's happened to Latin America. We've stuck without protection with the old model. So we have no way to go. So what we need to do now is to understand the new opportunity and take advantage of what import substitution gave us. So it's neither good nor bad. It was appropriate for the moment. It's inappropriate now. And it should not be rejected as a stupid thing that we did. We didn't do a stupid thing. We actually lifted enormous proportions of the population into better living. We created a very broad middle class with something which could have been contested, which could still be contested. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Carlota, let me move very quick to a second question that was not addressed enough due, uh, today. No? So earlier you mentioned the university policy link as something very important. No? And we still do not, ma uh, uh, do not match, uh, do, do not uh, know much the impact of, that we can have on the policy making. No? And then how to achieve a greater impact of the recommendation that emanate from the research, the research. How do you think the relationship between academic researchers and policy makers should be in practice? Well, I begin by repeating the last thing I said. We don't study policy innovation. We don't really know how it happens. We don't really know how it's evaluated as such. We study what is done, but we don't study it the way we used to study industrial innovation or, you know, how does it happen? How, how is it tested? How is it picked up? What, what does it require? Who can innovate? When, you know, as, as, a, uh, as a theory of institutional innovation, I think we don't have any. So that's my first problem. Second problem, most uh, policymakers, I mean, most uh, uh, students of innovation policy do not then become policymakers. Very rarely, most people go back and they become teachers and researchers in innovation policy. The problem is that the people who need the innovation policy knowledge are the policymakers. The connection is very flimsy. In fact, one of the things that happens that really hurts is to see the graduates writing to publish in English, not because they don't care, but because that's the way to climb the, the academic ladder. And if you don't climb the academic ladder, you're in trouble. Now, what's more valuable? Publishing in a high, very important journal in the North. Our journals, local journals, they're supposed to be less important and therefore only the people who cannot publish in the high ones. So they're not the best. So that's ridiculous. So, and the third thing is that when people come back, they don't work in policy itself. They don't aspire to being policy makers, even though, you know, people study political science or international relations and they expect to be ambassadors. And somebody studies engineering and they expect, they expect to build machines. So, you know, you study, what, why do we study innovation policy and then just write about it? Why don't we do it? Why don't we go and become policy makers ourselves? What would that do? Supposing 30% of graduates became policy makers. The other 70% could be in constant contact because they have similar language and all that. But even now, even if the others are not experts in policy making, in, in theory about policy making, we could have more contact. I mean, I know, <laughs> I know that Slavo is in constant contact with policy makers in Europe, but that's because the EU gives them contracts to do that. So we don't have an EU in Latin America that gives people contracts to go and work with the policy makers. So those are the things we need to do. Encourage people to work in policy, connect people with policy makers, try to answer their questions, try to, try to find out what their questions are. I will finish by saying something. 
when I was a policymaker, when I was a civil servant, I tried very hard to get the academics to do research for me. So every time I asked them a question, you know, about something very specific that I was going to do, they would tell me, okay, we can do that in a year. In a year, I need it in three weeks. No, a year, because, because you're going to write a paper and no, I need answers. Now, who is at fault? It's the authorities and the law of the universities that make it less valuable to help industry, less valuable to help uh, policymakers and government and whatever, more valuable to do research than to teach. It's not, it's not even good if you're a fantastic teacher. It doesn't count. It counts if you're a fantastic researcher publishing abroad. So we have our values all wrong. And of course, Judith Suits has enough things to add to what I just said, that we could have a big campaign to change the situation in Latin America. Hmm. Okay, thanks a lot. We definitely need to rethink the academic trajectory, but this requires a change in the evaluation of researchers. So it is not so easy to, to deal with both things. Okay, so let me give the, space, the floor to Slavo because time is running. Thank you. Thank you, Gabriela. Greetings from Greece. They cannot hear, um, they cannot hear you. Yeah, they can hear me, yeah. Um, <laughs> Kelot, I want to come back to your discussion with uh, Rafi, and the question is extremely uh, difficult, but uh, I think you're hard not, so I, I think it's a unique chance to press you a bit. Uh, the question is around your notion of techno-economic paradigm, which rests on this idea of close interaction between forces of production and social relations, so in that kind of respect has a strong Marxist connotation. So the question is... Uh, uh, how would you define your, let's call it, methodological or analytical approach to somebody who simply parachutes in, in your kind of intellectual world? I know it's not an easy question, but... Uh, <laughs> no, it's okay. <laughs> your questions are never easy, Slavo. Anyway, uh, okay, first thing, I have moved away quite a bit from the Marxist idea. What I have kept is like the, the essence there is a relationship between technology and social organization and institutions and all that. That's very strong. There is, but there are varieties. So there is no determinism. You can, you can shape in many ways the same technologies, which is what I said at the beginning about, about Greece and Sparta with the slave things, which, is, which did not really create one way of having society and of course the USSR and the US and etc. And for the third revolution, Germany, US and UK did different things and so on. So uh, basically it's not a strong link, but it is a real link. And it's almost, one could say that, the, that what the technology does is to create the space. So you have what's technologically feasible is, it has a frontier and it's enormous and it's much greater than what's socially acceptable. And that in turn is much greater than what's, uh, what's uh, financially or profitable. So since the profitable is much smaller than the socially desirable, then the state has to come in to, to move it so that there is more socially desirable things included in what finance does. So in the end, uh, society is constantly trying to get the, not finance, business in general, economically profitable. The economically profitable gets moved either with government procurement, with government subsidies, with taxes that are put on, on the opposite technology so that you have the incentive to do the other one, like we're now doing with green technologies now. So there are all sorts of things that the state does. So my work tries to look at the, the interactions between all those things in both directions. So that includes the state, that includes business, that includes society, includes government. Chris talked about the five spheres and he talked about how the synchrony between those five spheres, which includes science, which I didn't just mention, it's science, technology, culture, economics, and politics. So those five spheres, when one of them changes, like for instance, technology makes big changes, then all the others have to find a way of, and, and this 
asynchrony, when there is too much asynchrony between the various spheres, then society is in trouble. Those are the bad times. The good times is when everything comes into synchrony. <laughs> what I study are those processes of mutual influence. So I work at the intersection of those things and I look at the regularities across long-term history, not 50 years, 250 years of capitalism, market economies only. I don't study the way changes occur in other societies like the Soviet system, which was not a market economy, was not able to generate a revolution and it collapsed without even a whimper, you know, it just pff, nothing. They had no mechanism. Capitalism has a very strong mechanism between finance capital, production capital and the state. So you have these interactions and that's what I work on. I think this is excellent because this is the first time I'm glad I pushed you to articulate uh, <laughs> explicitly your approach. So I'm glad this will be transcribed and, and, and being in a book so uh, people will be able to-, to Eight really the book. I think it should all uh, be just online. Well, I'm happy at least for, for this, what you've said now. Uh, my second question very briefly also builds on your discussion with Gabriela, but I, I want to put it from more from a bird's eye kind of perspective, because in your work on technological revolution, technological sur uh, surges in your grand sy synthesis, you do not consider explicitly the impact of periphery. It's all kind of like more on, on the core. Uh, I mm. think that you've done a lot of policy work, but that's another thing. I'm interested more in your kind of Grant Citizens' work, where is the periphery? Okay, well, the first thing is that it didn't come into the book because it's too complicated. Because market economies, where practically everybody is in the market, and everybody acts in a market-like way, uh, they have regularities because, because they are in this market context. But developing countries are in a very complicated mixture of old things, new things. They don't really work like markets. There is corruption, there is power, there is you know, many things that play differently than market. I just told you that the Soviet Union couldn't, that's because they didn't have markets. So I cannot study their regularities. I can study how they adopted Fordist mass production with the help of Ford, by the way, and with the help of thousands of workers coming from Germany, from Europe and from the US and engineers and so on. They did use it to do something different, to set up another society. Uh, but what happens in the developing world is that you have different opportunities and different conditions to take advantage of them. So it could be that an opportunity passes by and nobody takes it. Or it could be that only a few, which is what happened with, uh, with the four tigers in Asia, they took the opportunity, the double opportunity. When do we have opportunities? As, as in the article with Luke Suter, we said, we have opportunities at the end, at, at the maturity of a technology, when the owners of the technology are willing to share it, to sell it, to teach it, or to have it stolen. It, it doesn't really matter because they're not making much money with it anymore. Mature, mature technologies cannot innovate, cannot really increase productivity, cannot increase markets, they're saturated. So they're not so interested. So that's one point. But another point when people can enter is at the beginning of the curve, when knowledge is in universities, when knowledge can be had by everybody, now even on the web, so people can innovate. And we now see all over the third world, which is no longer called the third world, global south, uh, lots of innovation associated with information technology and the leapfrogging like, like what the Kenyans did with the banking, mobile banking, mobile mobiles instead of uh, landlines. So it, it's much easier to do and we can do the same with, uh, with solar power instead of having all the big long electricity lines and so on. So we're talking about the possibility at the beginning of a technological revolution, also an opportunity, but then there is a double opportunity when one technology is reaching maturity, one set of technologies and the other technology is beginning. So that's a double technological opportunity. And that's what the four tigers took advantage of. So somehow that 
is not so easy to incorporate into the big sort of great surges model, but it is possible to incorporate it when I study, which I do. I have written several articles about this in particular, about the developing countries and, and moving uh, technological opportunities as a moving target and all this. So yeah, it's, it's difficult. It's bad enough having a big picture for the big ones. Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. I see this uh, coming uh, after your book, new paper, Windows of Opportunity, paper number two. Great. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Uh, it's all for me. Thank, Thank you. you. New Windows of You new see, they're all my friends. That, that really... <laughs> all your friends are giving you more job. <laughs> Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you also for those questions. I think um, it also unlocked um, a really great response, Carlota. I think that there's some unfinished conversations for us here also about the role of the universities and also the new windows um, of new opportunities. Um, we have 30 minutes left in this conversation and we want to invite some of the people that posed questions in the chat to pose their questions directly to you but it's going to be on a condition to the participants. And that is that you must pose your question in a very short and a precise way. So please don't make long speeches. This is Carlota's space. Um, I'm going to ask, I'm going to start by asking David Valvain to please um, uh, ask his question of Carlota. Rajesh, can you help me with the video so we can see if we can get David on? Or David, can you switch on your camera quickly so we can get you on the screen? My camera's on. Hopefully you can see okay. me. I can see you. Okay, great. Brilliant. David, can okay. you? Okay, I've got two questions, very quick questions. First of all, Carlota, I've always been a little bit suspicious of long wave theory. So Kondratiev waves and long cycles. So I'm just asking, I mean, the, the one issue about your TEP approach and the waves, the long waves associated with that is the assumption that there's this periodicity and a kind of a determinism about waves. And I guess I want to bring in here the, the, you know, the theory, if you like, of windows of opportunity or moments of um, conjunction, which occur chaotically and randomly. I mean, these are chaotic, complex systems. They don't behave according to what I would call periodic rules. Um, so I'm just interested why, why you have that view, why you stuck to the idea of period, periodicity. And the second question is also a very quick question, which is the question about whether systems of innovation is sufficiently powerful to deal with the societal challenges, particularly in developing countries. Um, I, I, I guess the criticism is, and this goes back particularly South Africa's experience with systems of innovation since um, 1996 or 1997 is that the, the systems of innovation approach is maybe agnostic or naive when it comes to geopolitics and that it's not powerful enough to break those linkages that keep countries like South Africa in a um, parlous state. Um, it seems to me that global supply chains specifically allow countries like South Africa to perpetuate systems of corruption and inefficiency and poverty um, and unemployment. So I'm just asking that question about whether you feel systems of innovation has, can ever provide sufficient directionality to address societal challenges. Thank you, David. Okay, first of all, uh, it's not precisely one of my main uh, positions or my main uh, statements is to be against long waves because the periodicity of long waves has no explanation to have upswings and downswings and upswings and downswings, whatever, even if you say it's about revolutions, I don't think it holds and practically every statistical study has proven that they don't hold. Mm -hmm. I called, I changed the name. I call them great surges of development. And I say they are not upswings and downswings. They are one period of sort of upswing. It's, it's a gilded age prosperity. It's a bubble prosperity, the initial period, which is what I call installation. The second period 
I call golden age, which is proper prosperity. So that is when part of the population gets lifted into better lives. And that's when the technologies actually give all that they can give. And between the two, there is a period when we have populism like we have now, populism, anger, anger resentment, xenophobia, all sorts of things and lots of autocratic uh, rulers and so on. And this is, can be found in history regularly. So why is that? It's because the market economy takes advantage of every single opportunity within the same set of, of technologies because the suppliers are there, the laws are there, the regulations, everything is in favor of continuing along the same path. When that's over, maturity, like I just talked before, no more markets, no more productivity increases, no more. So you reach a point when it's over. Then you have the problem of inertia from the ones that have been successful up to then and are not interested in changing. And the fighters that come with the new things that had been there, but being a bit on the side, like, like computers and things, they were a company there, but they were not the logic of the thing. Then when you have this new thing, you, you get the something going up and something going down. The new technology is going up, the prices of the new things going down, the prices of the old things going up because of inflation. And they generate inflation and the others generate deflation and there is a mess. So it's very difficult to see anything called a long wave up or down anything. It's, it's chaotic, that period. And then you have it. So you actually have a pattern that responds to the way that market economies absorb technological revolutions and how they abandon the old technologies and they, they adopt the new one, but don't forget it's market. So it's a lot of individuals taking decisions and some of them are inertial and some of them are breaking. So it's a much more complex thing. I mean, forget about long waves. I think long waves is wrong. It just doesn't fit. Whereas this sort of pattern, which is, is very different, it goes, it goes into the how the relationship between markets, the economy, technology, and the social institutional framework works. I mean, Thatcher Reagan destroyed the previous thing. And uh, after this, we need somebody, <laughs> hopefully some good leaders, to set up the new conditions. And about your second question, I, I was going to ask you to remind me what it is, because my memory is not working so well anymore. Uh, the second, uh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, about societal systems challenges and directionality. Systems of innovation. I think every theory has a space. Ah, huh? recording stopped. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Ah, okay. So you're not recording. It doesn't matter. Okay. So definitely, systems of innovation is not a theory about how do you get rid of corruption. It's not a theory about how do you create the conditions for development when there is an opportunity. It's not a theory about political behavior. It's a theory about the interrelations between the various uh, actors in the innovation space. And it does include, I mean, um, Ben Doke did include something that he called the wider vision of the of the innovation system where he includes the labor, uh, banks, um, you know, all, all the things that are around that are government uh, determined. But it's not a theory about government. But one of the things I'm asking for is precisely when are we going to do proper study of how innovation happens in government? And obviously, South Africa and any country. Goodness me. Again, it stopped. Anyway, I'm not going to bother if recording stops. Um, the, the whole thing about how governments can actually, in, in the case that you're talking about, what you need to change is government. I mean, not that government will change, not that government will change the context for innovation, but that somehow politically, and I don't know if innovation <laughs> studies can help that, uh, you have to change the nature of government. So uh, I would say that we cannot ask every theory to do every job, 
every theory has a space where it's effective. And, mm -hmm. and there are several theories that help several things. That's why we have so many disciplines, which we shouldn't. We should have more interdisciplinarity, but still what disciplines tell us is that we think that things are separated in different things and they interact. The problem is how many theories do we have that help us understand the interactions? Okay, thank you very much, Carlota. And um, thank you, David, for that question. Our next question is from Zida Muhammad. Can you activate your camera, please? Zida, are you there? Can you hear us? Uh, hi, can you see me? Yes. Yes, I, we can I, see I you. Great. I'm using my phone at the moment. Right. Uh, can I ask my question, Sean? Yes, yeah. please proceed. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Carlota and Rafi, uh, for that wonderful, um, inspiring session. Um, you know, I, greetings from Malaysia. I don't know whether you still remember me. I we met during the uh, Global X. I think the last time I, you know, actually heard both of you talk was in during Malaysia. the Global X in Malaysia. Yeah, uh, I have a question, Carlota, if you don't mind. Um, the thing is now, um, of course, you know, uh, we are you know, very much exposed in our field when we talk about sustainability transitions on all of these new tools that is quite popular in Europe, like, um, you know, strategic niche management, um, multi-level uh, perspective, uh, technological innovation systems, which can actually help to be a tool uh, in looking at, you know, how countries can actually strategize to move towards more sustainable, a sustainable future. And for example, Petronas, uh, one of the biggest oil and gas company in Malaysia now is trying to look into hydrogen, for example, and they are, you know, sort of um, asking help from the university to actually think about all of these ideas. Of course, these tools are quite useful in the context of Europe. I just um, want to ask for, for your advice on how, uh, you know, how feasible it is and uh, to use these tools in the context of a global south like Malaysia or in other developing countries and what are your advice on how we can use it in a much more constructive manner in, in our context? If we can get, get your wise advice on that, Carlota. Thank you. Sorry, Zida, when you say tools, do you mean uh, policy ideas like, like systems of innovation? Would you say that that's a tool? Yeah, or, exactly. Or what tools All are you talking frameworks. about? Those Sorry? frameworks. Uh, you know, like um, in the sustainability transitions, um, epistemic or, community. Or missions, Mariana's missions, for instance. Oh, that is, is one example, exactly. Uh, that is one example. Okay, well, I think Mariana's missions are great. You, they, they can actually be applied to any specific context as long as what you propose uh, makes sense, as long as you're going to incorporate both government and, and the private sector, as long as you're incorporating science and technology. I mean, it's a complex thing and you've got to understand how they work. You, you can't just say, we're going to do this and then not follow up. It's a much more complex thing. So I think that's good. Uh, the transitions, as far as I know, the transitions theory is mainly an explanation of how it happens. And therefore, you can, you can act in some of the spaces that the theory explains, but I'm not so sure that they have an actual policy method. I don't they know, do. maybe I'm ignorant. They do? Right, right. Okay. Yeah. Well, basically, I would say that there is no reason why any method of, of policy making cannot be applied in a developing country. There is no reason why. If you're intelligent about it and you're not applying it in a very uh, mechanical way, if you think about your real conditions, you can always adapt whatever is being proposed, especially if other people have experience in it. The best thing is to talk to people who have already applied, because one of the things that's so important about any policy tool is that you can always learn from your mistakes and you can always learn from somebody else's mistakes. So if there is a policy tool that's being used by several countries, make sure you talk to the others, the ones that have already done two years, three years of it, because you can learn about what works and what doesn't work and why you can discuss. You can be much more creative with that. One of the things that I think is extremely important is for us to set up ways of interacting with policymakers. Policymakers should be able to talk to others to see how did you solve this problem? How did you solve that problem? We have information technology at our hands. 
Imagine what we could do if we could have this sort of thing, not to listen to me and my ideas or whatever, but everybody who's working on some particular problem to get together and discuss how you applied it, what you learned, what was good, what wasn't good, why did you, you know, and then, you know, really share. And anybody who succeeds, then have them on and have them, and anybody who fails, have them on, let's talk. But for that, we need a structure of, and, and there are so many policy studies people in the world. We could actually have a, a sort of club, you know, a, a global club of policy studies, and then exchange information about failure, exchange information about success, detailed information about success and failure. That's, uh, I would say that that's my answer to you. Yes, it can be used, but make sure you don't do it blindly. All right, thank you so much, Carlota. Take care. Thank you. Zita. So um, we have a question. We have a few 15 minutes remaining. So let's see, Octavia asked a question. Octavia, can you please, um, switch on your camera and ask your question. I selected this one next because um, the issues in Latin America is always so close to Carlota's heart. So if Octavia is not coming on, then I'm going to ask the question. Okay, so I'm going to read it out to you, Carlota. It is, the question is, what about the sixth techno-economic paradigm that is information? How can natural resources reach Latin America countries developed today, the biotechnical and genomic research base in order to be an important player in the future. So it connects a little bit with what you also spoke about earlier. I, I, I have a problem with the sixth techno-economic paradigm. I am absolutely convinced that we're still in the fifth. We're not in okay. the sixth. And that people who think that there are, there are two sorts or three sorts. One that says that it's a fourth and that's uh, Schwab and all that. And that's about robotics artificial intelligence and CRISPR. Then there are other ones who say that the sixth is the green technology, the green paradigm, which by the way, Chris also wrote us a, a green techno-economic paradigm. So <laughs> I didn't agree with him, by the way, <laughs> we had big fights about it. And uh, the other is the, my idea of the sixth is that it is very likely to be biotech and uh, nanotech and materials. I mean, con being able to make materials do whatever we want and making biology also do whatever we want. This sort of science getting there. I don't think it's going to be tomorrow. I think it can take 20 or 30 years, but I think biology is going in that direction. And so mm -hmm. is material science. So I think very likely. And let me tell you, there is no revolution before in, in history that has not been around in gestation before it's necessary for it to come out and articulate. So we had, we had electronics and we had computers and we had all these things in the 1940s, 50s, 60s, the first computers were in the 40s. IBM was a mm -hmm. huge company. In the, but for it to come together to have uh, computers, uh, digital information, the web, which came much later, 24 years later, but still uh, they were using uh, regular telephony and analog, uh, uh, you know, all, all those things were being used early. But anyway, every technological revolution, you can more or less guess, but you cannot be sure because you cannot predict what science will do, even though people do try to predict, I don't think they normally can. So basically, my view is that we're still in the digital revolution and the information revolution. We're far from using all its capabilities. And there is nothing around that is uh, capable of providing the high productivity and the low cost and the decreasing cost that all things based on information technology can guarantee. But there is one thing that, um, God, I think I'm very tired. I forgot there was something important. Ah, how annoying, I'm sorry. I don't know what else I wanted to add. She was asking, yeah, sorry. About, about, I, go with the yes. next. I might remember. 
but I think I along this line, religion. yes, yes, it, it, it will come back, I'm sure. Um, Yop asked a, a, a very simple a, a question along the same lines, talking about the ICT, um, you know, development going on. Yop, are you there? Do you want to just be more clear about your question? Yes, okay. Thank you uh, for the opportunity. I love it to uh, see uh, Carlotta again after so many years. Um, I'm still in also in the ICT, but my question is the C of ICT, communication and networks and, and all kinds of connections are, are not stressed in most discussions about ICT. And the, there is enormous potential not only from the World Wide Web, but also in connecting people to let them cooperate and create value, which is still not... Uh, do you see also that there is an explosion coming on? Yeah. Well, I'm hoping it's going to happen, but I don't think it will happen if we don't have enough institutional innovation, because right now, uh, as I was saying, finance is taking things in the wrong way. I mean, they're, they're turning information technology into an instrument for the casino. It's the fantastic basis for a casino, for a global casino, which is what they're doing. And they have synthetic instruments. They're, everything finance does is information technology based, whereas everybody else is very often using technologies which are not advanced enough. And uh, there is the whole of the real economy that requires much more information technology and it's not being used. I just remembered what I wanted to say before is that my proposal to Latin America to, do, to, to take the opportunity of greening materials and putting technology into the processing industries but, uh, because globalization, because of the strategic problems that were visible, visible during the COVID, there is now the possibility of a lot of companies wanting to have processing in situ in the producing countries. So, so Latin America could think of the, of the possibility of doing all these things. And if they do, they might be as prepared for the next revolution as the Asians were for the previous, for this one because the, the Asians did a lot of the assembly of all the little things. They were the ones who did all the electronics, the original electronics with transistors and things. And as, as electronics advanced, they were already in the field. We didn't do any electronics except you know, TV sets and things like that. We didn't really work with the el little electronics, which is what the Asians were doing. So they were really ready when, when the moment came. So we could be ready with the biotech and, and materials tech and nanotech and all the other things that have to do with those natural things for, to be ready for the next revolution and then we can make the leap. Okay. Just two remarks. In uh, the ICT, there is the, the shift to, from electronics to optics, which is now going on. Which is uh, bioelectronics is another possibility for the future, yes, also. Yeah. But uh, I have stated that there are four network effects which are uh, uh, can be de defined. Uh, the fourth is new. That's the Van Til's law. Yeah, that's mine. <laughs> uh -huh. That you cooperate and connect people with very different skills to create synergy which is uh, much, much more potent than, than broadcasting or, or, or gambling. Uh, mm -hmm. To create value is, is going to be the key for survival. Thank you. Yes, of course. I think, mm -hmm. And I think that will also be more distributed than the current system. Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So our last question is from, um, from Mamo. Are you online and ready, Mamo? Is we there? Have and we yes, he's hello, coming. hello. There we go. Me? So sorry, I I, I wrote uh, mine in the chat. So what I said there is the intellectual contributions by the distinguished Professor Carlos Perez continues to inspire us with the following achievements: novel ideas on technology economic paradigm shift, yeah, right theory of uh, 
well, let me just put it. <laughs> the, uh, you know Mama, that I said, just, yeah. Just, just give the question from your heart. Don't read it. From okay, the okay, okay, that, okay, okay. Yeah. That... Right, but uh, yeah, okay. Uh, the question I have is uh, the following: the technology re revolution pattern uh, of the bank, the bust, and the renewal. Is it Chris Freeman says something about we need to reform economics to regenerate the environment? Now that we are in the climate change situation, what do you think of all these great ideas you have developed uh, that I put in the chat box? Is it possible that we can re we find values by which the current economics can be addressed mm -hmm. to create all one humanity, one world community type thing? How would economics mm -hmm kind of be reformed uh, to actually uh, deliver uh, a renewal, regeneration of our environment in this climate change time. That's my question for you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, the first thing we need to do is get rid of neoliberal economics and this idea <laughs> that the markets can do everything on their own. So, and so just doing that and rescuing some of the some of the older ideas in economic history, we can already do a lot. But there is something much more important than changing economics, and that's changing what governments do. So, of course, if they are following economics, then maybe that's the way to change, is to change economics. And there is a lot going on in, uh, you know, there are, there are groups, there is uh, INET, there are all sorts of people trying to bring an ethical capitalism ahead and an understanding of economics that's much more like political economy rather than just pure economics like a slice of reality that's disconnected from everything else and that works perfectly and that guarantees that the market will solve every problem on its own. All this ridiculous stuff which doesn't work. The only reason why it was possible to have it for a while is because when you have the early technological revolutions, in the early period of a technological revolution, you need to do this very risky experiment. And to believe that the markets will do everything sort of helps do that. But I think, and I said that in my book, that I hope that capitalism will find a way of acting also in the installation period. So we don't have to have so many victims. I mean, this is absurd. A system that in order to advance has to destroy a lot of people's lives. And then it advances and then it reconstructs. Why, why should we have it that way? There must be a way. But that, that at least I'm not worrying about that yet. If I live long enough to see the golden age, then I will start worrying about what to do in the next installation period. But I think all of you, especially the younger ones might start thinking about it. Okay, thank you very much. I, thank you very I much. Thank, thank you. Um, Rajesh just reminded me that I forgot over the break to announce the next event. So let me just quickly do that before we wrap up. Um, so the next event is on the 24th of August. Okay, let's go now. Um, and it will be between KJ Joseph and Q, Q and Lee. Um, there you go. Mm -hmm to handsome gentlemen for the next event. And um, please remember to register for that. And then I want um, to go back and I want to say thank you, Carlota. Thank you very much for agreeing to be interviewed. Thank you for sharing so much. You're an amazing role model to all of us um, and your energy and, and your ability to keep on is just amazing. I want to thank Rafi for unlocking this conversation, for easing you into this. Um, and, and in a way to get your passion going about this topic. I want to thank Gabriela and Slava. They asked really good questions that, that really also helped us to get into the specifics of this conversation. And then I want to thank all the participants. I thank you for the questions you've posed, for the comments. Um, thank you also for registering and for participating in this call. It's really appreciated. I want to ask Rajesh, can you put yourself on the screen just for a second? Um, I know you didn't agree to this, but I just want to have Rajesh in the center of the screen for a moment. 
Rajesh. Um, Rajesh for me is a champion. I know there's a committee and a lot of people involved, but Rajesh, I want to say thank you very much for your work to pull all of us together and to line up these events. You are making a really big difference in the world and um, this is not always noticed. So Rajesh, we just want to applaud you and thank you for this. Thank you for connecting the feeds, for the calls and for everything. So just with that, I want to end the day. Rafi said that we all reminded us that we have family commitments afterwards. So thank you all for participating and for being part of this event. See you on this, Rajesh. Rajesh, thank you very much. And um, can we have a picture together? Can all of us switch on the cameras? Okay, there's the invitation. As usual, Rajesh is busy pulling the strings, making it happen. Thank you very much. Do you have the picture, Rajesh? You, yeah, yeah. Okay, thank very good. Very okay, thank you all. We see you again on the 24th of August. In the meantime, keep on asking the tough questions. Bless you all. Thank you. Yeah, hey, uh, thanks, John. That was really good. Thank you, Andrew. Yeah, thank well, you. you're just a master at orchestrating things. Hopefully yeah, one more conversation. Unfortunately, it won't be where you are, uh, but uh, that's the way things yeah. went down. Anyway, thank you, thank you all. Thank you very much for for connecting. And Carlota, Carlota thank you for sharing so much. You, you really hung out there. That was wow. really great. We've got a lot to work with now, and we're waiting for that next paper. <laughs> next book. <laughs> Next book. A book. <laughs> ah. No, we're already on the paper after the book. <clears throat> and the book is just a small hurdle. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Bye, Carlos. Thank, thank you. It was great as usual. Thank you, <laughs> thank thank you very you, much, Carlota. everybody. Thank you. Very much. Thank you, Carlota. Gabriela. Thank you. Thank you all. Carlota, now you can pour yourself a glass of wine. I don't drink. I a glass drink. of a, a glass of 